Welcome to this video from Learn Electrics, in which we hope to answer a couple of frequently asked questions about TT systems. One recurring question is, why must a TT system have full RCD protection? And in this video, we will show you some of the dangers of not having an RCD installed. The first point to make is that we should not assume that the earth rod just outside the house is always at zero volts potential. It isn't. And during a fault, it can have a significant voltage on it. So let's get started and show you how this danger arises. And we will begin with an installation that has no RCD fitted. This is our basic TT circuit. In the no fault condition, the voltage and current will flow along the line conductor into the appliance and return to the transformer via the neutral conductor. Both the line and neutral conductors will be metallic, usually copper. In a TT system, there is no copper connection between the earth electrode at the house and the supplier's earth electrode. Should an earth fault occur, the earth fault current will flow to the earth electrode and then complete its journey back to the supply transformer through the soil or earth in which the earth rod is buried. In normal, fault-free conditions, current will flow from the top of the supply transformer at point A, through the main fuse, through the meter and breakers, into the consumer unit and all the way to the connected appliance at point B. Point B will be at almost 230 volts. Current passes through the appliance to point C, where it will be at almost zero volts electrical potential. Most of the voltage has been absorbed by the appliance and this is the correct thing for it to do. The current then returns along the neutral conductor from point C to point D. Point D is a common point for the neutral and the supplier's earth rod. They are physically and electrically the same point. The current then passes through the transformer where it is re-energised and begins its journey around the circuit again from A to B to C to D and so on. If we put in some typical values, A to B might be 0 0.5 ohms, and the neutral will be about the same, 0 0.5 ohms again. Most of the resistance or impedance will be in the appliance. A 1 kilowatt load drawing about 5 amps will have an impedance of about 45 ohms, much greater than the line or neutral conductors. Let's assume a fault has occurred inside the appliance. The line conductor is now making direct contact with the metallic casing of the appliance. Earth current will flow through the metal casing, through the circuit protective conductors and along the earth conductor to the earth rod. Then it will travel through the soil, the earth, to the supplier's earth rod, wherever that might be. Let's assume that we have a good earth rod connection of only 60 ohms. Anything below 200 ohms is considered acceptable and may often be around 40 to 80 ohms. But this will vary between winter and summer as the wet soil dries out during hot weather. The drier the soil, the greater the resistance. We can also look at the drawing as one long string of resistances and I find that this always helps me to understand what is happening during a fault. Starting at the top of the string, we have point A at the transformer with 0 0.5 ohms of resistance. Then the casing of the appliance, perhaps just a hundredth of an ohm. Next, the fault current flows through the copper earth cable to the earth rod, and then through the soil itself back to the transformer at G. Add all these resistances together, and we have a total of 60.61 ohms in our example. Look at this string of resistances. Where is the greatest volt drop going to be? At point F at the earth rod. To calculate the volts drop across each part, one method is to firstly calculate the current through the circuit. So what fault current will flow? And we can use Ohm's law for this. 230 volts divided by the total resistance is a total current of 3.8 amps, give or take a little. Go back to our string and, as shown, this 3.8 amps flows through every part of the circuit. It will always be numerically the same value. Now that we have the current and the individual resistances, we can calculate the individual voltage drops. Going back to Ohm's law, 
current times resistance gives us the voltage. So, if we multiply the total current by the individual resistance for each part, we will have the individual voltage drop for each stage. The calculations are as shown, and if we add all the individual voltage drops together, we will get our supply voltage of 230 volts, give or take a small amount for rounding up and down. As you can see, each part of the fault path will share the voltage in proportion to its resistance value. The bigger the resistance, the bigger the share of the voltage. And here are those voltages as a string again. Because the soil is the greatest resistance, the earth rod is actually sitting at 228 volts. And so is the earth conductor in the house, and so is the metal casing of the appliance that started this fault. All the house metalwork is at almost 230 volts. But the current is only 3.8 amps. It is never going to trip the circuit breaker, especially a socket circuit at 32 amps. The breaker will just sit there, allowing current to flow with absolutely no intention of disconnecting the supply and making the house safe. This is the danger. The circuit breakers will only operate for overload currents and not for fault currents, because we cannot get enough fault current. We need an RCD to give us fault protection. So let's install an RCD and see what difference this makes to the safety of the installation. Here we have the RCD installed in the consumer unit. There is no fault with the circuit and 5 amps flows along the line and into the appliance and 5 amps then flows back along the neutral and all is good. Now though, the appliance develops a fault. There is an earth fault and 3.8 amps of current, as before, now flows to earth. All the metalwork in the house becomes energised. We could have a situation where the 5 amps still flows into the appliance and the 3.8 amps of fault current as well. So let's do this. This is 8.8 amps flowing along the line conductor, but look what happens to the returning current. They split. 5 amps along the neutral and 3.8 amps through the earth. This means that there is an imbalance between the line and neutral. The currents are no longer equal. Is the current difference greater than 30 milliamps or 0 0.03 amps? Yes, of course it is. It's almost 4 amps difference, and so the RCD will trip and disconnect the supply. You might suggest that with 8.8 .8 amps of current along the line conductor, that a 6 amp MCB would trip. But this is not the case. A 6 amp type B breaker needs at least 30 amps of fault current to operate within the required time for safety. And types C and D are even worse. The truth is that even a 6 amp breaker is not going to give earth fault protection. Only an RCD device is going to do this. In a TT system, the RCD is providing fault protection and not additional protection. We are relying on the RCD to do the job that a circuit breaker cannot do in this TT system. And the RCD will certainly meet the required disconnection times for safety. Look at this extract from the Wiring Regulations book. This is part of the inspection schedule for an EICR. 4.18 asks the question, Are RCDs provided for fault protection? And this is the box that we should tick for TT systems with RCDs provided. How should we mount an RCD external to the consumer unit? This can be necessary if you come across a TT system with no RCD protection and with no available room in the consumer unit to fit an RCD. Or a split load consumer unit with 30 milliamp RCD protection for the sockets and shower etc but no RCD protection for the lighting circuits and so on. Here is one possible solution. Install a second RCD in a suitable enclosure mounted close to the consumer unit. Then, after correct safe isolation, place the incoming mains tails into the new RCD. Now, from the new RCD, install new tails into the consumer unit, keeping the length as short as is practical. In this case, all the circuits are now protected. I've included this example to show that it is not the perfect solution, but it is safer than having no RCD 
and it complies with current regulations for RCD requirements. A problem with this arrangement is that the sockets may still trip all the circuits if they cause the new RCD to trip first, but now at least the lights and other non-protected circuits are protected. In an ideal world, we would probably upgrade the board to a dual RCD model and share lighting and sockets across both RCDs. And you may also come across properties with TT systems that have excessively long meter tails. How should you protect these? In this example, the tails are over 10 meters in length. It could be that the intake position is at the front door, but the consumer unit has been moved to the utility room at the rear of the property. What protection have these cables got, especially if they've been placed underground and then become damaged by digging? What is going to disconnect these cables within the required times because the main fuse will have the same problem? Unless the spade or digger bucket connects with both the line and neutral at the same time, there will not be enough current flowing through the soil to trip the main fuse. In this case, we should install a 100 milliamp time delay RCD close to the electricity meter. This RCD will protect these cables now and it should always be considered where the main tails are excessive lengths. What is an excessive length, you ask? Anything between 3 and 5 metres may need RCD protection, depending how and where it is installed and how it is protected. Different network suppliers have different opinions on length, but they all seem to agree that anything above 5 metres should have RCD protection, as shown. Let's look briefly at loop impedance although we do have a separate video on this. Again, we are often asked questions on this, such as The wiring regulations state a maximum loop impedance of 1,667 ohms for a 30 milliamp RCD. So why do you tell me that 200 ohms is a recommended maximum? And why can't I use 1,667 ohms for everything? So let's look at this. We can start with a 100 milliamp RCD. Voltage divided by the RCD tripping current will tell us the maximum loop impedance permitted. But it is not 230 volts that we use. We should use the upper limit of the AC extra low voltage range as our touch voltage. And 0.1 amps is the same as 100 milliamps. So 50 volts divided by 0.1 amps gives us the maximum loop impedance for a TT system of 500 ohms. Now consider a 30 milliamp RCD. The same touch voltage of 50 volts AC and this time a current of 30 milliamps or 0.03 amps. Ohm's law tells us that 50 volts divided by 0.03 amps is 1667 ohms. So our maximum loop impedance now is this massive 1,667 ohms. But this value can be highly unstable and should be considered as the absolute maximum loop impedance if all else fails. What happens to the loop impedance in the summer as the soil dries out? The resistance will increase. Unless you have chosen the hottest and driest day on record with no rainfall for over three months as the day of your testing, how can you be certain that the loop impedance measurements are not going to go higher. A measurement of 1,667 ohms on a cold and wet winter's day will definitely rise above this maximum as summer reaches its best days of sunshine and drought. So readings below 200 ohms are considered reasonably stable across most seasons and we should ideally aim for readings of less than 100 ohms, even if this means adding additional earthing measures to reduce the readings. And what would the touch voltage be on metal work in the property if we could make the loop impedance less than 100 ohms? Again, Ohm's law comes to help us. 30 milliamps times 100 ohms gives us just 3 volts, which is a much more acceptable and safer touch voltage. The RCD will trip and disconnect the supply before the voltage on the metal work reaches even 3 volts. A brief summary then, in a TT system, RCD protection for all circuits is essential. This would be a C2 code, immediate improvement required. 
If a 100 milliamp RCD is installed upstream of a 30 milliamp RCD device, then the upstream RCD should be an S-type time delayed RCD. This RCD can be mounted outside the consumer unit in a suitable enclosure if necessary. Any domestic circuit that is worked on must now be upgraded to 30 milliamp RCD protection, code C2. And there we have it. We hope you've enjoyed this video, found it useful, and there's a little more knowledge has been acquired. Thank you for watching this video, it is very much appreciated. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos, and remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video. And here are some tips on getting even more information and help out of learnelectrics.com. At your web browser, enter learnelectrics.com into the search bar, select learnelectrics.com from the choices offered, and the website, as shown, will open up for you. You now have a couple of choices. You can search for a help item or any video by entering a keyword into the search bar on the right. Click on Return and all the help files and videos with that word in the title will be listed for you. They will be shown with a short description and each video listed will have a link shown that will take you directly to that exact YouTube video. Or you can browse through a list of all the available items and videos. To do this, Click on the LE logo on the top left of the home page and all of our items and videos will be shown. There will be 10 items shown on each page and at the bottom of each page is a page selector. Page 2, page 3, 4 and so on that will bring up the next 10 items or videos in the list. And don't forget that you can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel, don't miss the next one. Once again, thanks for watching and we hope to see you again very soon.